So I assume we can resume the program. So I'm uh, Johan Botterman from the BioCrop Science R&D Open Innovation and Strategic Partnerships team. So it's a real pleasure for me to introduce one of the first speakers now, moving into the plant and agricultural section. So after two excellent talks about where gene, gene editing might go into the human medical field, now we have two speakers about the uh, agriculture and plant science. So uh, the first speaker we do have today is uh, Dirk Inzee. So Dirk Inzee, I see the affiliation is mentioned, Ghent University, but actually he is the director of the plant systems biology department of the Flemish Institute of Biotechnology, also known as VIB. So what is VIB? VIB is actually a research organization having different centers of excellence localized at different universities in Flanders, Belgium, and Ghent University being one of them. So the VIB has built up a tremendous reputation. It exists about 25 years, a tremendous track record in science, also has been very important in the ecosystem in Flanders, Belgium, with more than 30 startups uh, by now. So Dirk has been for a long time involved in the plant science in Ghent, so he has done his PhD over there, was involved with the VIB, Plant Systems Biology Department, since the beginning. And his track record is, of course, very phenomenal. What I would like to mention is he has also has received quite a number of numerous awards, just to name a few. So he was awarded the prestigious award of World Agricultural Prize. And he is also a fellow at the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. And finally, also within the scope of this uh, within the scope of this symposium. He is also the uh, chairman of EU SAGE. So what is EU SAGE? So that's a consortium of European plant research organizations and scientists that are advocating within Europe for the use and application of gene editing in agriculture. So welcome Dirk here today. So it's really a pleasure to have you here with us in Monheim and give us a kind of a perspective on your research at the plant systems biology and also how you see potential applications of gene editing for trade improvement as well as plant breeding. Welcome, Dirk. Thank you, Johan, for this very kind uh, introduction and um, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here and to be beyond you and our lunch, and like, and which of course will mainly consist out of plants and, like, and, uh, and uh, agriculture produces. So um, my, um, uh, my, my interest, and like, in fact, like, is um, uh, really in, in understanding uh, yield in plants, what are the factors determining uh, that and how we can apply that. And as you once said, like, we uh, com try to combine curiosity-driven research like, with um, translation to what we call benefits of society means actually uh, startup companies, uh, collaborations uh, with uh, companies, including uh, with uh, Bayer. Uh, like, and, um, so um, I'm going to talk about this one specific uh, program that we are doing on it now, because it's, I think, uh, quite um, advanced uh, in using gene editing for crop milk improvement. And, but I'm first going to introduce you where we come uh, like, from and why uh, I think uh, this is the next uh, phase in uh, crop improvement. So um, my, my lab is essentially interested in um, in plant organ size cells. So in, and I think it's um, quite interesting to see that this remarkable constant. If you look to a field, these plants like all look very much the same. They have the same size, more or less, like of leaves, of seeds, of ears, and, like, and so on, and, like, and, and that's very much determined by the genotype and of course by the environment. When you have drought, you often have smaller plants, and, like, and so on, and, like, and um, so, of course, all this um, understanding uh, plant organ size is, of course, extremely relevant like also for, uh, for plant and like yield. Uh, obviously, uh, when you see here uh, this uh, corn, this teosint, like which has been by uh, classical breeding, been, been really been transformed, I would say, like, to this modern corn varieties. And we have seen today even that that goes on like, with increasing the number of uh, kern rows and like, in, in maize. Sometimes it actually is an advantage to have smaller size. I mean, uh, you all, most of you know that um, the Green Revolution is actually based upon reducing the size of the, uh, the stems in wheat and in other, also in other plants, also thereby increasing, the, let's say, the, 
amount of energy which goes to the seed compared to actually the vegetative um, material. So um, um, my lab has been work working for the last 15 years understanding organ growth and of course you have to work on a model and we worked on the, the size, but determine the size of leaves and again in particular, we worked on a model plant, uh, Arabidopsis, a little, a little bit of white mouse like of, um, plant uh, biology. And we worked also on a maize and a more in a translational uh, aspect. And we tried to understand all this at various levels, I mean, how uh, leaf size is influenced uh, by uh, various um, environmental conditions, particularly in drought. Uh, but what, uh, what is the cellular basis? Uh, like, uh, how did, do the gene networks translate? Uh, like, and so on. Uh, like, and, to make a very, very long um, story short, and again, I think uh, hundreds of papers, and like not only by me, but by many colleagues and like all over the world, we came up with molecular networks like of genes regulating uh, leaf uh, growth. And, again, and they can be divided in several this modules. Obviously, cell division is like important. And like, I mean, the more cells you have, the larger organ cell expansion, so the size of organs. And we, de we defined the number of mechanisms uh, which actually determine uh, leaf size. The number of cells you start with in forming a leaf, the time that uh, cells proliferate, and like in fact during development, the speed of cell division, uh, the time that they expand, are large the cells expand and they can be very big in plants. And uh, particularly for uh, the dicots, also the, the activity of certain meristemoids. But in, uh, this maybe, I'm not going to discuss all this, and, um, but you see also this kind of networks and like here, and in fact, like also depicted in this networks, genes, which on one hand, when you overexpress them or ectopically express them, they increase the organ size, they're all depicted here in green, and also depicted genes, when you knock them out, like in the individual mutants, we see also an increase in organ size. That's all. You can modulate actually this pathway, and in fact, uh, by uh, by overexpression or in fact uh, inactivation of these uh, genes. Now um, we have been trying to uh, um, see what, to what extent uh, we can translate this this information to crops, uh, because we here at uh, an, uh, a company which is very much involved in, like, in crop improvement. So rather than showing all this molecular data like on Arabidopsis, just giving you some examples of how these things uh, translate. So this is one of the modules uh, like which uh, controls actually the cell, cell cycle. In fact, and you see the, uh, the, there's a very complicated pro proteolysis machinery with the proteins, which is actually activated uh, like by, um, by ubiquination. And like in fact, and there is your D ubiquination enzymes involved. But what you can see on the on the, on the slide, like I hope, like is that uh, when you overexpress, when a dominant negative uh, mutant, but you can also make uh, uh, multiplex cell mutants, you can actually increase uh, like organ size, uh, not only in here leaf size in Arabidopsis, this is the control, this is here, the, but you can also do that in Brassica, and you have a positive effect uh, like on uh, seeds. And there are also some reports that there is also increase in seed size uh, like in uh, maize. Another example, a bit more um, that you can really uh, like increase, uh, like uh, organ size, quite spectacular. It's a novel genus that actually not yet been uh, published, uh, like here, but it's involved in regulating S phase, uh, like, and and if you really knock them out till this uh, this particular gene, you see that there is uh, compared to the controls a very uh, important increase uh, like in size. And, and what we actually very often see that genes uh, which increase uh, the size of a leaf also have an effect on, on the size of other organs. I've showed already that in the previous slide. In the case uh, like of uh, Brassica, there is also increased uh, like leaf, uh, seed size. And here you can see that as well, that there is increased uh, like root size. So the mechanism which really dictates uh, like that uh, a large an organ uh, like is will actually uh, work in various organs, uh, leaf seeds, and so on. Like, and now, another example like, is, uh, again, um, going a little bit further from now, from Arabidopsis to crops. This particular, the same gene, this IP10, was also used to make knockouts uh, very recently in soybean. And there we see actually also now uh, in uh, greenhouse trials, but also now very recently also in field trials, that we see an uh, incredible enhanced uh, 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 growth. And actually also, uh, although the data are not yet completely in also a seed set. Another uh, pathway which we worked uh, like on is this peapot pathway. This, um, and just to, to illustrate that this is a negative regulator of um, uh, organ growth. And again, 
And in fact, there are many components of this regulator. It's actually a whole complex, like where uh, this people protein interact, like with kicks proteins, and, like, and so on, and topless proteins. And not going to bother you about the detail, but any inactivation like, of that pathway, and then of course you can use CRISPR like, for that, like leads to an enhanced uh, organ growth. And, like, and this is illustrated here, uh, for example, in, um, in soybean, like, where you have a larger seed, larger plants, and, like Medicago, larger seeds, and so on. And so this is an inactivation of this peapot uh, component. And, like, in fact, uh, this, I think, cannot really see it, but this peapot here, so if you inactivate uh, like this, the kicks proteins, and, like, I think it's on the next slide, and, like, you see the similar thing. This is in tomato, like where you have uh, uh, you have to make a double mutant with uh, genome editing, and you see a large uh, organ size, actually a large fruit size and flesh actually in that uh, tomato plant. Uh, this goes further. This, uh, for example, in pea, and like, and, uh, uh, and you can see the similar things, and like, and, um, and then of course this complex is also subject to proteolysis, and like, and, um, so proteolysis, which is mediated by E3 ligase, and like in fact, and like in uh, this, which we call SUP, it's a collaboration with Yun He Li in uh, Beijing, and like in fact, so also here, like when you overexpress this uh, particular protein, you see a uh, positive effect on organ size cucumber in this particular case, and this is an, actually a natural mutant in poplar, which turned out to be a mutant that overexpress uh, like this uh, this uh, protein. Just to illustrate all that you can actually, uh, with uh, modifying single genes, and like in fact, and there are many, many, many more examples that you can modify organ size and like in uh, crops. And like in. So with, with this, this information and like in mind and having this molecular network in, um, in Arabidopsis, we asked the question, can we e really stack all the genes? And, like, and that is, uh, this has already been published a couple of years ago. So we actually took 13 genes and made all possible combinations. And the surprising thing like, is uh, that we find in the majority of cases uh, additive or synergistic effects. So people ask me all, always why are these cuts like, here in these leaves? Well, because you have to flatten the leaves a little bit uh, curled. You make a, with a scissor a cut and then you put it on a plate and then you can picture that. But for example, here, the, oh, sorry, that is a double mutant. Uh, you can see here that there is, uh, these leaves are larger, and actually they, all the leaves are larger, and, and so on. And again. So genes can be stacked, like in fact, and again, uh, quite, uh, quite in, the most, in most actually cases. And again. So uh, we went further with that and made uh, triple like, mutants, and again, um, uh, that can be seen, seen like here, and it goes like further, and in fact, and again, so this triple, particular triple mutant of three genes, like they uh, turn out all in actually in different parts like of this crop regulatory network, not only increases leaf size, like, but also seed size and like, uh, floral size. And the problem with this, uh, this kind of experiments, and like in fact that you run into this more technical and problems with co-suppression because the overexpression, you use, use certain gene construct, and uh, also in particular in Arabidopsis, many of the mutants are generated by what we call tDNA insertion, insertion foreign DNA, and if you start to combine that, uh, like in fact, uh, then you run into problems that uh, uh, genes do, uh, which are in the construct do not express the, the protein cell like, anymore properly. Like, so that there's a limit like, of combining these gene cell by this particular like, approach. Now, uh, this, uh, if you have noticed, uh, all the examples I showed uh, was translating uh, data from Arabidopsis to dicots. It, um, to, uh, and so what about uh, monocots, uh, which actually is the basis uh, like, of much of the food uh, that uh, like, we eat? And there, we have much more problems uh, like, to translate uh, like this uh, data. And there's a fantastic study actually published uh, like by uh, Cortiva uh, uh, quite recently where they analyzed more than 1,600 constructs, mainly based upon data from uh, Arabidopsis, most of them over expression constructs. They tested them in field condition. And, um, and this uh, uh, work showed the enormous attrition rate that you have when doing this kind of exercise. If you look uh, like here, like you see uh, like only that there's a handful uh, like of genes, uh, like in fact, which uh, showed the reproducible uh, like effects uh, like in field trials, uh, like in a couple of percent compared to the varieties they used as control. On the other hand, you see a large number of genes, uh, like in fact, we are re really when overexpressed are very, uh, very negative like effects. 
So here also, okay, you see uh, that from this 1,600 uh, uh, constructs, and you have actually a handful, uh, like of two handfuls uh, like of genes, which remain and which uh, are actually, I guess, uh, the subject of further research. So this is a very, uh, very uh, sobering uh, like observation that uh, despite this enormous amount of work, I mean, the translation actually, what happened in crops is just relatively um, uh, poor. So also we were involved uh, like in, this, the, this, um, in uh, this, and we actually combined uh, like which a little bit, uh, rather the brute force uh, like approach, uh, like we have been using data from Arabidopsis and uh, combined it with a um, very detailed transcriptome analysis in uh, various tissues uh, like in, in the maize. Uh, like, and so in fact, uh, like we are also able to discover uh, quite a number of genes actually with at least in our hands, and that is sometimes going to field trials, also uh, can in fact increase um, um, uh, organ size. And some of the genes are listed here, I will show you some examples. So what is the evidence for that? Like, well, we we actually looked to these plants in, a, in two different conditions, well watered and mild drought size condition. But what is nice, we are using actually also phenotyping platforms, automated phenotyping platforms to phenotype these plants throughout their life cycle up to actually up to maturity. And like, so uh, that gives a pretty good um, indication like, of how these plants uh, behave. Like, and, so some of the genes I will actually show. I mean, I have no time to uh, to discuss them all. And, and, um, but for example, this is um, a recent one, which also was found and, like, in the study by uh, Corteva, and, like, and where you have a ear weight like, and, like, here that you see this uh, uh, there's a control on well water condition, but under uh, drought conditions, you see this increased uh, ear weight uh, quite dramatically. This is a gene involved in ethylene. It's a plant hormone ethylene uh, signaling, actually, uh, ethylene perception. So originally described, uh, like as an, uh, again, uh, as a leaf-enhancing uh, leaf uh, gene, uh, like here, and that's also what we observe. But again, the same uh, principle, we see the, uh, the read, the read through, uh, like in fact, uh, like in the development of other organs. Another gene, uh, which has already been uh, published a little bit uh, further, this is um, uh, plastochrome, which uh, in this particular case, you need to express it actually under a very specific uh, promoter because if you express it too hard, you'll get uh, leaves continue to grow and you almost get no, uh, no uh, kernels. But this has been published. This particular gene like, is doing very well. This has been uh, tested in field trials in hybrids, both in the US and in um, <coughs> Belgium. And we observe double digit increases actually in agronomic relevant uh, parameters. And again, so this is um, a nice example of how uh, things uh, can translate. Another one that like, is here is um, Angustifolia tree, like, is um, also a regulator of chromatin. It's actually also not uh, yet published like, here, but uh, like, what you can see, you see a 32% increase like, in uh, biomass. And this is a segregating population. It's also overexpression of this particular gene. And another one that can continue with for some time, like here, it's a new one. It's, an, um, it's a variant like, of an uh, histone gene, like in fact, which um, uh, goes, I mean, actually improves quite a lot of growth, like under, particularly under mild drought stress conditions, like here. So you can see, compare these plants with this ones, like here. And uh, this is actually subject to uh, field trials, gene editing, I must say, field trials uh, like in this year. And we actually now in the process of analyzing the, uh, the data uh, like for these uh, plants. Now, we also asked the question in corn, can we combine genes? And there actually we came up with the same answer that what we've seen in Arabidopsis. So in all combinations that we have used uh, today, and that's something like 10 different combinations, and I'm only going to show you one, we see an additive uh, effect uh, like on uh, gene stacking uh, like here. And this just, uh, here is a gene I didn't talk about, this is uh, the overexpression of a GA20 oxidase, it's a gibberellin. You see larger plants here on the left, and uh, this is this plastochron, uh, like also larger plant, and if you combine these two, and there is uh, some shift in this slide, uh, but this is the combined plant. You can actually see this corn plant, which is uh, becoming very, very large, uh, like a uh, very, um, I mean, it was really difficult to measure, actually. Uh, like we had to buy a special, uh, uh, special ladder to measure the height of these plants. Uh, like, and, but also what is more important uh, like is uh, that um, 
can clearly see uh, that there is a an, uh, an strong, uh, in this particular case on the leaf size in, the, in these graphs, a strong um, additive effect on combining candidate genes. So with this information like in mind, um, we, um, we see this combinatorial effects both in Arabidopsis and maize. And um, so very often resulting in additive um, and in occasionally um, in more in Arabidopsis than in maize synergistic like effect. And this is exactly also what breeding has shown like us for many years. Breeding has shown that many agronomic traits such as yield and stress tolerance are governed by multiple small effector genes which you can combine. That's what breeding is actually doing. And uh, of course, uh, this is, um, also depends very much on the environment and like, on the genotype. But the big question uh, like, is what genes, which genes to combine. I showed you in the beginning this network in Arabidopsis and like, what, uh, what should you do? Like, and, I mean, you, if you start to test uh, like, all pairwise combinations, you very rapidly and have a huge amount of construct to test. If you go for triple combinations, like of quadruple combinations and so on, it becomes almost impossible to test on them. So with this um, idea like in mind, uh, we have been thinking for quite some time uh, how we can uh, combine breeding and uh, gene editing. And we call this approach uh, breed it. And in fact, and it's combining, in fact, uh, classical breeding approaches like here, crossing of plant phenotyping, association of traits like with genotypes, field evaluation, combining that with the ease of making new alleles uh, based upon genome editing. For this, we used uh, CRISPR-Cas, Cas9, and of course, you can target whole field gene families and, like, and so on, and we can track all the mutations like, individually. So let me um, guide you through this, how we actually did this and to some of the results. Well, we started actually with selecting uh, maize genes, which we thought uh, sometimes we had the evidence that when inactivated, because inactivation is very easy with uh, gene editing, as you have uh, all noticed, when inactivated could enhance growth-related traits. Those are leaf length, leaf width, biomass, drought tolerance. Um, why leaf? Because that's what we are working on. It's also easier to measure. And in fact, and then this selection came mainly from work on maize uh, itself, like in fact, but also work Arabidopsis and, uh, and uh, rice, and, uh, and we selected 70 genes. We had later on some dropout. Finally, we ended up with 60 genes, and some of uh, these uh, names of these genes and gene families, I will not discuss all this or name till like here. I will show you later some uh, of more specific cell like here, but cell cycle inhibitors, cell like, uh, the cytokine and gibberins, and so on like here. So this was the first step like in this um, so the next step, like is, and that's I think, is to make a maize plant and be to be called editor. And the maize plant actually here uh, constitutively express homozygously the Cas9. So the Cas9 does not do anything; it's a no negative effect. Like it's just sitting there. Like in fact, and and this, like in fact, this uh, plant, this plant was actually super transformed with um, constructs we call script constructs, so script and editing. Like that. Um, and the script, script constructs are in fact like being this, uh, contain, uh, each script construct contains 12 different guide RNAs, each under control of its own promoter and the own terminator. And, that, um, and these, and like in fact, uh, 12 uh, guide RNAs are corresponding to the 60 genes that we have selected to start like with. 60 genes, when inactivated, would increase actually uh, growth related uh, parameters. We also designed like primers, specific primers for every gene, so that we could actually, in a multiplex -like approach, we could actually follow this mutation, every, uh, every uh, gene individually in the subsequent population. So next we transformed this uh, script, five script constructs, so five times 12 guide RNAs, and like in, in the, each uh, to this, um, to this uh, Cas9 uh, construct. So as soon as you super transform the editor line with the script construct, you start to get uh, edits because the guide RNAs are presented uh, to the CAS. And so this, you generate uh, plants, of course, different plants which have script one, script two, script three. In the primary transgenics, you have various amounts of gene editing, actually it's quite uh, efficient. But these plants, uh, in fact, then can be subsequently be used for uh, breeding approaches. You can 
the, 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 you can cross script one plants with other script uh, one plants which have different edits or you can cross sell script one plants with script two plants, uh, plants to combine to have 24 guide RNAs in, in one plant. So this is uh, what is actually depicted on this uh, slide like here. So you, starting with this uh, initial group of um, plants like here, you essentially start to breed with it. And during this whole process, we follow every plant individ individually by multiplex um, uh, uh, sequencing. So we know exactly what allele that we have in these plants. And of course, since the Cas9 remains present like in these plants, you get novel mutations along the way. Each time, of course, if you cross with uh, a script 1, with the script 2 plant, you also actually uh, offer uh, wild-type alleles to these plants, which are again subject uh, to uh, editing. It might sound this, uh, uh, complicated, like, in fact, but it is rather uh, made uh, simple because, like, in fact, we follow all these alleles uh, throughout uh, this uh, process from every plant individually by this multiplex sequencing. So we follow all 60 genes and their mutations in this process. And we combine this, actually, this whole um, machinery uh, with uh, phenotyping, like, of course. So we observe that most of the of mutations with CAS uh, occur in the T0, so in the, uh, the primary supertransformed editor plants, and in the T1 generation. Most common are like our out of frame and like indels, and, um, and it's actually quite easy to saturate uh, gene families. So quite easily we found, in some cases, we use gene families, and we quite easily can find mutations in all of these genes, not necessarily in the same plant, but you can, in fact, easily be decombined by crosses. From the, the 60 initially selected genes, we found edits in 59 of them. And again, just this is an example like here um, for script 4, and again, uh, where you can see the frequency like, of this. Uh, this has been published already, so we can look for the details into that. And again. So, Besides actually following all the mutation in all plants, like we phenotype them, we have this automated uh, phenotyping platforms. It's again an arrow which, oh, sorry, which uh, is shifted um, here. Uh, oh, there's a, a, there's this, this, the arrow for where we can follow, well, like in fact, seedlings to adult plants. And again, we doing that all under different conditions, well water, mild drought, uh, nitrogen deficiency, and actually combination of nitrogen deficiency and uh, mild droughts, that's other conditions. So what we get out of that, like, well, we first, uh, like, if you look to the single scripts, uh, like, in fact, uh, like, and, um, and uh, then, for example, we found in many genes in GA metabolism, and that's for the specialists here, not really a surprise element effect, but you see in, particularly the, for leaf length, you see that leaves are more narrow and they become, uh, like, longer when you engineer uh, like this, uh, this uh, create mutations, uh, like, in these uh, genes. Um, another example, uh, like, like here, where we found in script 2, uh, like, in fact, where the mainly genes uh, like, which on, on cytokine metabolism, we clearly see an improvement, uh, like, in fact, of the uh, fresh weight and the dry weight uh, like, when these plants are submitted to mild drought stress condition. Another example uh, like, is uh, like in um, script 3, uh, like, also in uh, drought stress condition, and you see specifically the condition uh, like here. It is our uh, inhibitors of the cell cycle and also a number of drought responsive uh, genes. You see actually very similar um, positive uh, like effects. Uh, like, uh, plants grow better under these uh, like conditions. The next example is a script uh, like 4, which were um, TCP transcription factor and GRFs. And there we found actually that uh, certain combinations of genes increase actually leaf width, uh, like in fact, uh, like and without too much affecting uh, like in this, the, um, uh, the final uh, size of these uh, plants, and also positive effect on uh, biomass. So once uh, like, you um, have, have a set of mutations, it's like breeding, and, like, in fact, you can start to combine. You can already settle that. You can bind, um, bind scripts, intranscript, so uh, a script, uh, script which has certain edit uh, like with uh, script one, uh, edits with with the script one, another script one adding, but with other edits, and you can combine it. Of, you co of course, you can make combinations uh, like of multiple scripts. So script three with script four, and then you can actually, you went to 36 uh, like genes, and, like, and so on. And each time we select uh, for the best performing plants, and uh, so we use them actually in the breeding approach, uh, really to select for those combinations in the 
those combinations of alleles and the pre-selected genes which are outperforming uh, the rest of the population. So, um, give you a couple of examples, like here, like, so, we, um, uh, and, uh, so we are still in the process of doing that, but I can tell you that it's been very successful to select combinations which are doing uh, quite uh, well in this um, setting. So, what you can do with, uh, in the end is a, is a kind of network like that. So, from uh, the initially selected allergenes, we found uh, that if you look to various traits, like here, fresh weight, dry weight, moisture content, final leaf width and leaf length, you can see that there is an association uh, of genes. Uh, like in fact, the mutations in the genes, they associate uh, with this phenotype. So what you're actually doing uh, is from the gene space, the 60 genes which we have selected and can be of any network that you're interested in, what we actually reduced actually this gene space to genes uh, which are more likely actually to uh, give a positive uh, phenotype. For example, if you're interested in increasing dry weight, I think this KR, they are KRP, like, and this uh, Omeo box transcription factor, they're really interesting genes. Like, and this CKX cytokine oxygen genes, very interesting genes, but then certainly the TCPs and, like, and so are negative contributing to that phenotype. So this is an, an important um, uh, way to reduce this uh, complexity. However, um, I have to say, like, in fact, uh, there's one problem with that, is that this is a breeding approach, and like um, the breeders will know, it's very difficult to do replicas when you combine uh, plants, because every combination is unique. And that's also, so we see actually the uh, same uh, like, uh, thing uh, like here. So we see actually combinations uh, like of alleles, uh, like, but if you really want to do quantitative uh, measurements, you need repetition and statistics actually to do that. Uh, like, so you have to need, need to have the gene, the same uh, genotype. So for this, we are using um, uh, aploid uh, like induction. For those who are not familiar with that, uh, what, is, uh, what, what this is, uh, like, well, this, there are certain mutations, uh, like, norm, uh, like, in fact, uh, like here, uh, when that gene is mutated, uh, like here, when you, uh, when you pollinate uh, like a female plant with this uh, pollen, uh, like here, then the male genome will be elim eliminated. Uh, like, and this is um, a fantastic uh, way to, uh, to, to actually st to, uh, make uh, homozygous uh, like plants uh, like here. Okay? Because you create, uh, like in fact, when this, uh, for example, this plant contains many different uh, like edits, you actually create uh, like a plant, uh, like in fact, which is haploid, with all you have this genome, and then by colchicine treatment, you can uh, convert this into an, a double haploid, uh, so an homozygous uh, plant. This works uh, like very well. It's a standard technique. It was not really standard, but it's been used uh, before in, in corn breeding and breeding of other crops. Uh, like, and and it's, uh, the principle, uh, like, in fact, uh, is that you reduce the complexity, the heterozygosity, uh, like, in fact, uh, like here, you reduce uh, like that to an homozygous uh, like population. Uh, like here. And this um, allows you actually to, um, to do repetitions uh, like in these yield uh, like experiments. Uh, like, and, um, so um, uh, this works uh, like very well, and we have actually demonstrated uh, this uh, in combination with this uh, breeded, we call it no high breeded, uh, like in fact, for example, where, when you deal with very complicated uh, intercrosses, intra, inter intercrosses, for example, between script one and script four, uh, four this we already talking about 20 different uh, genes. For example, this plant or uh, this parental plant, they have a number of edits. Sometimes these edits are, like are uh, it heterozygous. We sometimes see also mosaics. That means that means somatic edits, uh, like, and which are not transmittable. But in fact, we could convert uh, this uh, like here, and this is just an example. But you have many different combinations possible into double haploid uh, populations, which, for example, in, which contain mutations in these four genes, and which allow you then to uh, phenotype and then properly. So this um, uh, one of my final slides, uh, like, is, uh, that um, this we have been using, uh, like, in fact, uh, to to really map out. And this particular is only with one script, map out the uh, genes uh, like, which affect the uh, leaf uh, like, width. and you can actually see uh, that um, that certain combinations uh, of genes uh, like, do actually much better actually than um, than uh, other combinations. So because you now have repetitions uh, like here, the same seed stock. We can have, uh, we can apply much better statistics. So that it's hidden by this transfer of uh, slides uh, like here, but uh, allows for statistics, statistical analysis that you treat. But um, some shift in the slide uh, like happened uh, like here. 
So, uh, in conclusion, uh, what I would like to um, send you as a take-home message: um, this is breeded approach, where you actually can you allow you for scanning gene networks, um, in, uh, and uh, where you can start to look for higher order gene combination that determine uh, certain crop traits. And it can be uh, anything what you are interested in, like in but uh, like obviously we have all these networks. And it, I think with this particular approach, you can actually reduce this to something which is uh, workable with. Like it's, um, in fact, it's a kind of a fast track knowledge based on a breeding effect, but where you now look to variation in a pre selected number of genes, like in fact, rather than uh, in a variation in the entire uh, genome. Like and it also, uh, we can fix the like gene combination for further analysis, also for further breeding approaches. Actually, it's a very low technical uh, hurdles because once you have this editor plants, if you want to check for the combination like of 16, uh, oh, sorry, 60 genes, you need only five transformation, five constructs, five transformation, and it then the rest is actually breeding. And of course, it can be combined like with um, with many different uh, variants. You can do knockdowns, promoter bashing, for example, base editing. Also, you can combine it with oligo insertion, really to uh, boost up the expression of certain genes, and so on. So that's uh, all underway, and I hope that I've triggered uh, some interest in this approach, uh, like here. And these are some of the people who have been involved into that. And actually, the paper has just been published. Uh, like this is, an, you see the names of the people uh, like involved, and uh, particularly, um, I'm, uh, I mean, I would like to acknowledge here Ilde Nielsen, which uh, runs the, this lab together with me. Uh, and Tom Jacobs, uh, Lawrence Paul, and uh, Tom Rüttig from the ILVO. Thank you very much.